you mentioned the SIR model. I think uh, there are certain ideas there of growth, of exponential growth. What maybe have you learned about um, pandemics from, from making that video? Because it was kind of exploratory. You were kind of building up an intuition. And it's, again, people should watch the video. It's kind of an abstract view. It's not really modeling in detail the whole field of epidemiology those those people it's <laughs> they go really far in terms of modeling like how people move about i don't know if you've seen it but like there is the mobility patterns like how like the tra like how many people you encounter in, in a certain situations when you go to a school when you go to a mall they like model every aspect of that for a particular city like they have maps of actual city streets they model it really well and natural patterns of the people have it's crazy. So you don't do any of that. You're just doing an abstract model to explore different <laughs> ideas of uh, simple pedag. Well, because I, I don't want to pretend like an epidem I'm an epidemiologist. Like we have a ton of armchair epidemiologists, yeah. and the spirit of that was more like, uh, can we through a little bit of play uh, draw like reasonable ish conclusions, um, and also just like uh, get ourselves in a position where we can judge the validity of a model. Like, I, I think people should look at that and they should criticize it. They should point to all the ways that it's wrong because it's definitely naive, yeah. right? In the way that it's set up. Um, but to say, like, what what lessons from that hold? Like, thinking about the R naught value and what that represents and what it can imply. Um, What's R naught? So, R naught is if you are infectious and you're in a population which is um, completely susceptible. Uh, what's the average number of people that you're going to infect during your infectiousness? Um, so certainly during the beginning of an epidemic, this basically gives you kind of the um, the exponential growth rate. Like if every person infects two others, you've got that one, two, four, eight uh, exponential growth pattern. Um, as it goes on, and uh, let's say it's something um, uh, endemic where you've got like a ton of people who have had it uh, and are recovered, then uh, you you would the R naught value doesn't tell you that as directly because a lot of the people you interact with aren't susceptible, but in the early phases it does. Um, and this is like the fundamental constant that it seems like epidemiologists look at. And, you know, the whole goal is to get that down. If you can get it below one, then it's no longer epidemic. If it's equal to one, then it's endemic. Um, and it's above one, then you're epidemic. So, uh, like just teaching what that value is and giving some intuitions on how do certain changes in behavior change that value? And then what does that imply for exponential growth? I think those are, um, general enough lessons and they're like resilient to all of the chaoses of the world um, that it, it's still like valid to take from the video. I mean, one of the interesting aspects of that is just exponential growth and mm. the way we think about growth. Is that one of the first times you've done a video on, on uh, no, of course not, the, the whole <laughs> uh, Euler's identity. Okay, so. <laughs> sure, I guess I've done a lot of videos about exponential growth in the circular direction, yeah. <laughs> uh, only minimal in the normal direction. I mean, another way to ask like, do you think we're able to reason intuitively about exponential growth? It's it's funny. I think it's um I think it's extremely intuitive to humans, and then we train it out of ourselves such that it's then really not intuitive. And then I think it can become intuitive again when you study a technical field. Uh, so what I mean by that is, um, have you ever heard of these studies where in a uh, like anthropological setting where you're studying a group that has been disassociated from a lot of like modern society. And you ask what number is between one and nine? And maybe you would ask, you've got like one rock and you've got nine rocks. You're like, what pile is halfway in between these? And our instinct is usually to say five. That's the number that sits right between one and nine. Um, but sometimes when uh, numeracy and uh, the kind of just basic arithmetic that we have isn't in a society, the natural instinct is three mm. because it's uh, in between in an exponential sense and a geometric sense that uh, one is three times bigger and then the next one is three times bigger than that. So it's like, what's, you know, if you have one friend versus a hundred friends, what's in between that? Yeah, 10 friends seems like the social status in between those two states. So that's like deeply intuitive to us to think logarithmically like that. Um, and for some reason, we kind of train it out of ourselves to start thinking linearly about things. So in the sense, yeah, the early, early basic math is uh yeah it forces us to take a step back it's it's the same criticism if there's any of science is the lessons of science make us like 
see the world in a slightly narrow sense to where we we have an over-exaggerated confidence that we understand everything as opposed <laughs> to just understanding a small slice of it. But I think that probably only really goes for small numbers because the real counterintuitive thing about exponential growth is like as the numbers start yeah. to get big. So I bet if you took that same setup and you asked them, oh, if I keep tripling the That's size of this rock pile, you know, um, seven times, how big will it be? I bet it would be surprisingly big even to like an a society without numeracy. And that's the side of it that um, I think is pretty counterintuitive to us, uh, but that you can basically train into people. Like I think computer scientists and physicists, when they're looking at the early numbers of um, like COVID were, they were the ones thinking like, oh God, this is following an exact exponential curve. Yeah. Um, and I, I heard that from a number of people. Uh, so it's, and, and almost all of them are like techies in some capacity, probably just because I like live in the Bay Area. But <laughs> but for sure, they, they're cognizant of this kind of, this kind of growth is present in a lot of natural systems in a lot of, in a lot of, in a lot of systems. Uh, I don't know if you've seen like, I mean, there's a lot of ways to visualize this obviously, but Ray Kurzweil, I think was the one that had this like chessboard where um, every every square on the chessboard, you double the number of stones or something in that chessboard. I've heard this is like an old proverb where okay, it's like, you know, someone, <laughs> the king offered him a gift and he said, ah, the only gift I would like, very modest, give me a single grain of rice, rice for the first right. chessboard and then two grains of rice for the next square and then twice that for the next square and just continue on. That's my only modest ask, your sire. Yeah. And like, then it's all, you know, more grains of rice than there are <laughs> uh, anything in the world. Um, by the time you get to the end. And I, I, my intuition falls apart there. Like I would have never predicted that. Like for some reason, that's a really compelling uh, illustration, how poorly breaks down, just like you said, maybe we're okay for the first few piles but after, uh, of rocks, but well, after a while it's game over. You know, the other classic example for um, gauging someone's intuitive understanding of exponential growth is uh, I've got like a lily pad on a on lake, really big lake, okay, um, like Lake Michigan, and that lily pad replicates. It doubles um, one day, and then it doubles the next day, and it doubles the next day. Um, and after fifty days, um, it actually is going to cover the entire lake. Okay, so after how many days does it cover half the lake? Uh, Forty nine. So you you have a good instinct for exponential growth. Right. Uh, so I think a lot of uh, like the knee jerk reaction is sometimes to think that it's like half the amount of time yeah. or to at least be like surprised that like after 49 days, you've only covered half of it. Um, yeah. I mean, that's the reason you heard a pause from me. Um, I, I literally thought that can't be right. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> so even when you know the fact and you do the division, it's like, wow. So you've gotten like that whole time and then day 49, it's only covering half. And then after that, it gets the whole thing. But I think yeah. you can make that even more visceral if rather than going one day before you say how long until um, it's covered 1% of the lake. Right. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, so what would that be? Um, how many times you have to double to get over a hundred, like seven, six and a half times, something like that. Yeah. Right. So at that point, you're looking at 43, 44 days into it. You're not even at 1% of the lake. So you've, you've experienced, you know, 44 out of 50 days and you're like, ah, that lily pad, it's just 1% of the lake. But then next thing you know, it's the entire lake. Mm 